Hi there. Let's do some self-service training. First of all, congratulations on your decision to once again install Germania arm takeoffs. Maybe it's your first time you are working with Germania arm takeoffs. But either way, let me assure you, you made an excellent decision. I don't know which model you bought. It may have been the B1 to the B3 or the SB or the Model S. And, but either way, you will be in excellent shape for the next 25 years. How do I know that? Let me take you through the story just for a few seconds here. You probably know I started Germania back in 1974 and then in 1997, sold it to De Laval, retired for a couple of years, and then in early 2001, started up again with Technologies for Agriculture, also known as Tech for Ag. And at Tech for Ag, we specialize in nothing but buying existing Germania installations, either complete parlors, everything included, or just any group of equipment, accuways, takeoffs, backflush, whatever is available. Typically, for example, here's a unit that probably came out of a parlor maybe 12, 18 months ago or so. It was installed in 1976, so it was milking cows until, let's just say, uh, late 2002, so that makes it, what, 26 years, and yes, the unit is in pretty bad shape, but keep in mind, it milked cows 24 hours a day for 26 years. If you may have traded in your units like this, I may have bought these units outright. At any rate, we take the unit, totally disassemble it right down to the bare frame. We then straighten the frame out, if that's what's called for. Send the frame to Chicago to the hot tip galvanizer. A couple of weeks later, we get the frame back. It looks like this. And then we gradually reassemble the unit, and this is pretty much as we ship it. Certainly, there's the cover on there. This one happens to be on the Model B, the square corner cover. The Model SB comes with the round corner cover. All the decals are new, so it's a very nice look on unit. And uh, basically, as you already know, the units work like new. They look like new, and we certainly warranty them like a new unit, roughly 15 months. In all likelihood, your units were installed by your local Germania or De La Val dealer. Maybe you even installed them yourself. But let me point out a couple of things just to make sure you got it in the right position. Height-wise, there is not much decision to be made. The lower mounting bracket of the arm takeoff goes on the lower rump rail. And pretty much all herringbone parlors today have the lower rump rail roughly 28 inches center of the rump rail down to the grate. So if that's where your rump rail is and you have the lower mounting bracket of the takeoff right there, height-wise, it is positioned correctly. Uh, next factor we have to look at, how is the unit positioned relative to the length of the cow platform? Now that depends on which unit you have. Do you have a Model B or Model SB? And the difference on those two is that the Model B has a right angle manual clutch plate and the Model SB has a 45 degree angle automatic clutch plate. If you have the Model B, it roughly, the face of the unit, the cover of the unit, roughly is 45 degrees to the length of your pit wall. If you have the Model SB with the automatic clutch plate, then the face of the unit, the cover, installs exactly 90 degrees to the curbing or the face of the pit wall. Okay? The last position you have to check is where is the unit installed relative to the length of the cow or what is its distance away from the cow? And the only way to determine that is when the arm is attached to a normal cow any old average cow, the arm should have an almost perfect Z pattern. In other words, 90 degrees here and 90 degrees there. That is your average length of cow. If that's what it is, the unit is in the right position. If the arm on most cows looks like this, you have to move the unit further away from the udder. If the arm on most cows looks like this, sort of almost straight, 
then you have to move the unit closer to the other. So what you're after is roughly a pattern like this for all these reasons, because now if you have a shorter cow, you have this adjustment available. If you attach it to a longer cow, you have this adjustment available. Let me take you through the basic steps of how the unit might be operated. There are some personal preferences. Much of it is up to you. But cow is ready to go. You prep the udder, push the start button, push the arm down a little bit, and then you would attach the teat cups to the udder. Simple enough. However, at that point, you have to make a decision. And that is, would you put the weight of the claw on the udder so this chain would be loose here, okay? Or do you put the weight of the claw on the arm? And that makes a significant difference. Now, this is a self-service training tape, and I don't want to go into all the implications of what this might mean. There are lots of other videotapes available. For example, if you give me a call, and my phone number is on the screen there, I'll gladly send you a tape, uh, for example, Norton Dairy, that shows what is the best way to operate a double 12, double 16, Norton Dairy happens to be a double 20, herringbone with arm takeoffs. And uh, in that tape and the various other ones, we discuss the implications of weight of the claw on the other or weight of the claw on the arm. Basically, it has to do with if you put the weight of the claw on the arm, you avoid any kind of fall-offs and squawking. And that's critical if you have one person operating a large powder, like for example a double 20, which has become very common. So in those cases, we recommend to put the weight of the claw on the arm. But then many of you have personal preferences and opinions, and so you might say, no, the weight of the claw should be on the udder, because the weight helps out the milk the udder out faster and cleaner, and that's fine. If that is the way you prefer it, then let's do it that way. But once again, there is numerous tapes out there that show these various milking routines in detail with interviews of the milkers and the owners. Give me a call and we'll fix you up with those tapes. And that's an excellent way to find out how other dairymen operate these parlors very, very successfully. Like I mentioned earlier, one person operating 40 machines, milking 120, 130, 140 cows per hour. Give me a call. Now let me introduce to you the 11 major component groups of the Model SB arm takeoff. First there's the arm, and I'll come back to that because there are some details to be known. Then the automatic clutch plate, there's the flow sensor. Behind the flow sensor is the vacuum shutoff. Above it is the main valve assembly. Above that is the manual automatic valve or MA valve. Behind that is the uh, end of milking timer. Above that is the two minute startup timer. Up here we have the height adjustment, counterweight height adjustment. And behind the square tube, I may step over here for a second, is the retract cylinder. Okay, as long as we have the camera on this side, let's talk about the arm just one more time. This happens to be a 12 inch, 3 times 12 inch, 3 link arm. We have other arms available. There's a 9 inch arm, 9 plus 9 plus 9 for short stall distances. There's a 4 link arm where we take this link here and break it one more time so there's another link point here. And that comes in handy in some special situations once again where the cow to cow distance is less than 45 inches. 45, 42, 44 you would go with three link arms. Anything less than 42, you probably should have the fourth link. Next, the clutch plate. We call the automatic clutch plate to make the distinction to the manual clutch plate on the Model B. The whole idea is if the cow, heifer or whatever, kicks the arm, that the arm comes automatically back to the level position. Go something like this here. You know, the automatic clutch plate is spring-loaded and therefore brings the claw and the arm back into the level position. The flow sensor, as the word implies, senses the milk flow from the cow, and in just a minute I'll show you exactly how it works on the inside. 
Okay, behind that is the vacuum shutoff. There's not much to explain. This is simply a hose squeeze valve. There's a little air cylinder there. We pressurize it. It squeezes the hose and therefore disconnects the vacuum to the claw. Above all of that is the main valve assembly, the red button, the nose piece, the 4A valve or PT421, and a pressure sensitive pilot. Now, this is a little bit special numbers and special names and languages. I'll come back to that several times. By the end of the tape, you'll be familiar with it. So anyway, there's the main valve. Then we talked about the end of milking timer. Basically, it's nothing but an air chamber. It comes in various heights, therefore various timing, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever you want. There's an amplifier valve, and I'll tell you later on how that works. Okay. Then we talked about the manual automatic valve, common sense. It's either in the, to the left, it's always manual, to the right, it's always automatic. And basically, this is nothing but another hose squeeze valve. In other words, the air in the red hose here either goes through, as it does right now, or we squeeze it shut. And then it's in manual. And one more time later on, I'll explain to you exactly how that affects the timing of the machine. Okay, next is the startup timer. This is a two minute timing circuit. And in a minute, I'll tell you exactly how it works, but it's a two minute timing circuit that basically deactivates the automatic portion of the machine for the first two minutes that the machine is on the cow. In other words, if she's a little bit slow, let down, three times a day, milking, late lactation cow, the two minute startup timer makes sure that the machine doesn't come off until it's been on the cow for at least two minutes. I'll come back to that. Next, the uh, counterweight and height adjustment. If you have this unit, obviously you have this exact arrangement, which by the way, is the very original design that we had in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, in the later 80s and early 90s, for about 10 years, we didn't have this counterweight. We had two cylinders, one for retract, one for counterbalance. The second cylinder took the plate of the height adjustment. We had that design for about 10 years because we had a, a difference of opinion with one of our competitors on a patent question. And uh, the patent ran out in the early 80s. And then Germania went back to the counterweight principle, somewhat different design than this one. Personally, I've always liked this counterweight design best. It's by far the smoothest and uh, easiest to operate without any question whatsoever. So any machines that we are now getting back from the field that have two cylinders in there, in other words, the units that were installed in the 80s, we convert right back to this design, namely the original 35 pound counterweight. Okay, now, why 35 pounds? Because it counterbalances everything on the other side. There's the square tube, the automatic clutch plate, the three link arm, claw and teeth cups. All of that is counterbalanced over this five inch pulley here to the counterweight. And therefore, no matter where you set it, the machine stays right there. Finally, the retract cylinder. Easy enough to understand. When you push the red button, the retract cylinder goes down, releases the chain and the arm. Here we go. Okay. You attach the machine. When the cow is done milking, the main valve comes out and ever so slowly. The retract cylinder does two things. It reels the arm in, but it also lifts the entire arrangement over the curb and out of the way. While we're at the retract cylinder, let's talk about the retract speed. The speed is adjustable. Once again, personal preference. We recommend that you retract the arm and the claw as slow as you can stand it. Obviously, looking at it from the cow's point of view, if the arm were to slam back, it might startle her and give the arm a good kick. So we want it nice and smooth, just about where it is now. Okay, there it goes, real, real slow, real nice, you know, and it's adjustable. And let me show you how you do that. It's very, very simple. Up here on the machine is a little exa adjustable exhaust valve, 7 16 wrench. You open the counter nut, loosen the counter nut, take the needle valve, and first close it up all the way. Right there, you can feel the resistance. From there, you turn the needle not more than 90 degrees or a quarter turn. Let's put it right there. I can't see it from down here. And hold it and close the counter nut, and that's it. Now, if that is about as slow and as smooth as the machine goes. If you wanted to retract faster, 
maybe open it a half a turn or three quarters of a turn. That's up to you. Before I introduce you to the functioning of the air circuit, let me show you how the flow sensor works. There it is. There's an outlet, a lower portion, an upper portion, and the whisker valve that everybody talks about right there. Now, the best way to understand how it works, let me show you a cutaway picture. All right, one more time. In this case, in the picture, we took the outlet off, but there's the lower portion of the flow sensor. There's the inlet. That's sort of the sanitary portion of the flow sensor. Milk comes in here and then flows out that way. And there's the upper portion of the flow sensor, the non-sanitary portion. There's a center plate in between. What basically happens is like this. The milk comes in, as you know, in slugs. It doesn't exactly flow slow, smoothly through there. It comes in with slugs. And therefore, the pendulum sorter does just that. It pendles. Okay. There's a stainless steel shaft with a highly precision machined bearing exactly in the center. Up here is a plastic ring. And the whisker valve right up there is called a whisker valve because below it is a barely visible stainless steel whisker. And that whisker is engaged to this plastic ring here. So what happens is during milk, fl milk flow, the pendulum keeps simply moving. The plastic ring is moving, obviously. And the way the whisker valve works is sort of like your other wash hose in the pit there. When you squeeze it, it's open. When you let it go, it's closed. So during milking, the whisker valve is open, 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 open. No more milk flow. The pendulum stands quiet. The whisker valve is in the center position and therefore closed. All right, let me introduce you to the air circuitry. Ultimately, that's the heart of the machine. It's the reason you're watching this tape. Matter of fact, let me make an important point. Maybe you have had experience with air circuitry before. Chances are you have, and it's not that widely used. In the milk parlor, it just has to be a very, very good way to control equipment. The point is this. If after watching this tape, you have a good understanding of it, good for you. If you have a half a good understanding of it, because some people have difficulties with it, others get it on the first try, that's okay too. The important point is this. If the machine is not functioning correctly, we, I would strongly encourage you to do your own service work first. If for no other reason, like now you're watching the tape and we absolutely love that. If you understand how this machine functions, then obviously if something goes wrong in your parlor, slightly elevated somatic cell counts, cows not milking out 100% right, whatever, you know, those things happen. If you don't understand the machine, then your logical conclusion would be, well, it's the machines is the last thing I added to my parlor and therefore whatever is not going right, it's got to be the fault of the machine. On the other hand, if you understand the basics and you understand the function of the machine, you know there is no magic. And therefore, if there's a somatic cell count, a bacteria count, or a cow's not milking out, the cause would got to be some that somewhere else. Let me make an additional point. There's a 15 month warranty on these machines if you buy them from Tech for Ag. Germania has a 12 month warranty. During the warranty period, we want you to do your own service. If you're only halfway trained and you dig in here and you wreck something, it's covered under the warranty. In other words, whatever you do wrong, I'll gladly stand behind it. Now, why would I do that? Very simple. First of all, there is absolutely positively nothing you can do wrong here. And second is the point I made a minute ago. It is way more important for us, for you to understand the machine, than to forever think there's all kinds of magic and mystery and then pay $50 and $100 for a service call to your local dealer. So please dig in, have a good time. By the way, there's a sticker. Sometimes we put it here, sometimes we put it back there. Tech for Ag, it's got my name, it's got my cell phone number on there. It's got the main number of Tech for Ag on there, and there's either Joe or Tim. 
if there is something that puzzles you after you've watched this tape, while you're serving the machines, there's still something that puzzles you, don't hesitate to call. We'll gladly help you out over the phone. Different color hoses. What do they mean? First of all, there's black. And black in Germania technology always means air supply. So in other words, air compressor, air preparation package, bunch of piping and over the parlor, into the parlor. Black supplies the air to the takeoffs, the cow traffic, back flush valves, whatever. There's our main valve. I'll come back to it in a second. Blue hose and red hose comes out. The blue hose is pressurized when the cow is not milking, when the machine is not milking. So when the machine is in the rest position, like this one is right now, then blue is pressurized. On the other hand, you push the button, attach the machine, blue is exhausted, and red is pressurized. So red is always on and blue is always off. Maybe that's a better way to understand it. When the entrance gate is closed, that would be off. Therefore, that hose would be blue. When the entrance gate is open, that hose would be red, and a couple other instances like that. Okay, finally, we have gray. And in Germania technology, gray circuits are always timing circuits. So automation by definition means we are doing some timing. 20 seconds here, 10 seconds there, in the back flush, three times 20 seconds. It's all done with air timing, and whenever we have a timing circuit, the color is gray. Okay, let me take you through the basic cycle here. What happens when you push the start button? You push the button. The black air goes through the main valve and is routed into the red circuit. Keep in mind the blue one is exhausted. We go up the red circuit and we come to a T. From where we go, A through the manual automatic valve and from there to a flow restrictor, but we also go all the way up over the top of the machine and into the top of the retract cylinder where the red air pushes the cylinder down, releases the chain, you pull the arm out, attach the claw to the cow. Okay, let's go back to the T one more time, the one that's first in line after the main valve. The red air goes off to the left through the MA valve into a little brass component here called the D restrictor. I'll come back to it in just a second. The red air goes through here. Let's start the machine, first of all. Okay, there we are. Let's assume you put the claw on the cow. Okay. The switch right now is in automatic. In other words, I can move the hose there. You see it's sort of loose. Therefore, the air goes straight through. If for some reason or another, you don't want the machine to come off automatically, you put this valve into manual, which squeezes the hose. You see, now I can't move it. And therefore, no air goes through to do to the rest of the circuitry to do what it's supposed to do. And certainly now the machine will stay on the cow forever either until you put the switch back or, for that matter, until you pull the main valve back manually. Okay, MA valve. D restrictor. First of all, why is it called a restrictor and why D? Well, it's called a restrictor because it restricts the airflow. Let me demonstrate real briefly, real quickly here. We pull off the red hose and you can hear an appreciable amount of air escaping. Okay, and now we're going to pull off the gray hose. And you can still hear air escaping, but this is maybe only maybe 2% of the air that goes into the D-restrictor. So it restricts the air flow substantially. Why is it called a D-restrictor? Because the company that makes this little jewel only makes four of them, A, B, C, and D. D happened to be the smallest one. That one fit into the circuitry some, what, 28 years ago, just right. And so there you are. It's a de-restrictor, and it restricts the airflow from the red hose into the gray hose. Gray air circuit. We're coming out of the restrictor, very small amount of air, to a cross. 
From the cross we go in three directions, straight up to a little valve arrangement that's part, part of the overall two minute startup timer and I'll come back to that. We are also connected to what we call an amplifier, a big word for a very simple piece of equipment. The air bleeds straight through the amplifier and into this 10 second air chamber. Okay, now what's happening between the restrictor and the air chamber? Well, it takes 10 seconds with the amount of air for this air chamber to build 35 psi pressure. Now, where does this 35 psi come from? You remember earlier on I said Germania Palace Black Hose always has 70 psi in it. All control circuit, anything, it's every, always 70 psi. Why all of a sudden 35 psi? Well, it has to do with this pilot. Remember, the restrictor puts air into the gray circuit. Whatever is happening, whatever is connected to the gray circuit always has the same or equal pressure. So as we are building 35 psi here, the pilot senses 35 psi, there's 35 psi on the whisker valve, 35 psi on the amplifier, 35 psi going to the startup timer. This pilot, 34 AS or sometimes called the PT110 pilot, by the way, they're two different manufacturers, both pilots work equally well. The 34 AS pilot fires when it senses 35 psi. When the pilot fires, it shifts the main valve back into the original position. You remember when you push the button, you shift the main valve a little bit in this direction, which starts the machine. The pilot fires at 35 psi and it shifts the button back into the original position. Let me stop it right there. Okay, in summary, you push the button, you start the machine, the MA valve is open, the air goes to the D restrictor, the D restrictor puts a little bit of air in it, 10 seconds later the pilot fires, the machine comes back out and the claw comes out. So far, so good, fairly simple. Only one problem. Really, we don't want the machine to come out in 10 seconds, you want to stay on a cow and milk the cow. So somehow we now have to override this 10 seconds with something else. That something else happens to be the whisker valve. You remember the picture I showed you earlier? Pendulum, milk hits the pendulum and the whisker valve is open, 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 open. Pretty simple. In other words, all the air that the de-restrictor puts into the gray circuit, the whisker valve exhausts. So as long as the cow is milking, there is no pressure building in the 10 second chamber and therefore the machine will stay on the cow just fine until she milks out. No more milk through the flow sensor, pendulum stands quiet, whisker valve is closed and guess what? 10 seconds later the pilot fires and the machine comes out. Okay, I still need to explain the startup timer to you, but before I explain the details, let me come back to this pressure timer or the 10 second timer one more time. You know, that's what it is. It is a pressure timer. You remember D restrictor, small amount of air, 10 seconds later we reach 35 psi, the sensor picks up, the, the, the pilot here picks up the 35 psi, kicks the main valve back. In other words, we slowly build pressure from 0 to 35 psi. We are building pressure. It's a pressure timer. Let's go to the exhaust timer here, to the startup timer. The startup timer runs for two minutes, but it works quite a bit different from the 10 second timing chamber there. How does it work? Well, first of all, you remember we said that when the machine is off, the blue hose is pressurized. Okay, so the machine comes off, blue hose is pressurized, the air goes through this little component, I'll come back to it, it zips through there and in about one or two seconds this entire chamber is pressurized with 70 psi, right? Black air, 70 psi, through the main valve, into the blue hose system, 70 psi, machine comes off, takes about a second or two and the entire chamber is now pressurized, reservoir off. 70 psi air. The machine is off. This does absolutely nothing. It just sits there. Okay, now you push the red button, attach the machine to the next cow, 
Now things start happening. The air reservoir that is trapped here now bleeds backwards very, very slowly through this component. I'll come back to that. It bleeds back very slowly, slowly through the component back into the blue hose. The machine is now milking. The red hose is pressurized. The blue hose is exhausted. There's no air in it. Therefore, the air reservoir here slowly bleeds backwards into this empty hose and then it comes out, incidentally, at the main valve. Now for this chamber to totally exhaust takes two minutes. It's called an exhaust timer. Okay? Exhaust timers, by the way, are not very accurate. So we call this two minutes, two minutes, 120 seconds. It might time out in 110 seconds. It might time out in 100, 130 seconds. Question is, who cares? As long as you have roughly two minutes at the beginning of milking in case the cow doesn't let down or you are slow attaching. You have two minutes where the machine doesn't come off. What do these little components do? And by the way, what really is this all about? You remember earlier on we talked about a de-restrictor. A de-restrictor does just that. It restricts a large amount of air to a small amount of air. This is a similar component, but it is called a flow control. And a flow control, on the one hand, does the same thing a restrictor does. Namely, it takes a large amount of air and restricts it into a small amount of air. However, it has a check valve type of bypass. So in other words, if you know anything about electronics, in the electronics industry they call this a diode. We call that a flow control. A flow control does two things. It restricts the flow of air in one direction only. In the other direction, it lets it bypass full flow. Okay, now back to the startup timer. The machine comes off, the blue hose is pressurized, and I said in one to two seconds, this entire chamber is pressurized with 70 psi. In other words, the air comes from there zips through the flow control wide open and instantly pressurizes the chamber. You push the red button, put the machine on the cow, the blue hose is empty. Now this air cushion very slowly bleeds backwards to the restrictor portion of this flow control back into the empty blue hose and it exhausts down at the main valve. So there's a flow control. It's a diode in the electronics industry, slow one way, fast the other way. Flow control. What about these little jewels here? Let me take the hose off. <coughs> and basically what we have here is a pilot, wonder over wonder, that's a second pilot in the machine, and another valve. Now this is a tiny little pilot as opposed to the 34AS pilot on the main valve. This pilot is called PT100. PT, by the way, stands for Pro Time. It's a PT100 air pilot, and it's nothing but a miniature little air cylinder. It's a one-way operating air cylinder. And this pilot reacts to any pressure. You remember the 34AS reacts to 35 PSI. This one reacts to any pressure. In other words, when the chamber pressurizes, when the machine is in the off position, this air cylinder has a little piston in there. It zips down and stays right there. Simple enough, eh? Okay, now it is screwed to this little valve. This valve is called a two-way valve. You remember earlier we called the main valve a four-way valve? This is called a two-way valve. Why it's called two-way valve? That's only two ways. It's got in right there and it's got out right there. So two ways, okay? Now, the gray hose is in, right, and nothing attached there. So if I push this valve like that, it's in the open position, open from there to there. That's what the pilot does. Let me put it back together, take the blue hose back off here. Makes it easier to assemble this stuff. <coughs> okay, and now you sort of should be catching on how all of this works. Okay, machine is off, we pressurize the chamber, we have 70 PSI, we push the pilot down, the pilot opens the two-way valve, and now we have an open passage from the gray hose to there. What is it good for? 
You are starting the machine, you push the red button. The de restrictor starts putting air into the gray circuit. But we may have trouble with this cow. Three times a day milking, she's late lactation, letting her milk down slow, maybe only very little milk at the beginning. If we didn't somehow bridge those difficulties, obviously the machine would come out 10 seconds after you push the red button, and your milker, after doing that three, four, five times, would become very irritated. So to make life easier for him, we simply created another artificial exhaust for the gray timing circuit. That's all it is. You push the red button, two minutes worth of air cushion here, which flows through the flow control very slowly. For two minutes, that pilot keeps this little valve open. And therefore, all the air that the de-restrictor puts into the gray circuit escapes right there. In other words, it can't build pressure. It's not doing anything down here. Two minutes later, this chamber is empty. The pilot goes up. The two-way valve closes. Ta-da! No more leak. Now the whisker valve takes over. As long as the cow is milking, the whisker valve now exhausts all the air, or almost all the air to be accurate, that the de-restrictor puts into the gray circuit. Cow stops milking, pendulum stands quiet, whisker valve is closed, we start building pressure. Ten seconds later, the machine comes out. By now, you should have a reasonable understanding how all of this works. And really, you got to admit, it's pretty darn simple. Really nothing to it. Nevertheless, the only reason you're watching this tape is because when something doesn't work right, you want to take care of it yourself. Now, there are three groups of things that might go wrong. Number one, you attach the machine to the cow. The cow starts milking just fine. She is in the middle of milking, 10 pounds per minute, and all of a sudden the machine comes off. One problem. Second problem, you attach the machine to the cow, the cow milks out just fine, but then it won't come off. And number three, eh, a little bit of mechanical things I've got to explain. The arm, the height adjustment, some minor stuff like that. Let's start with the first one. You attach the machine to the cow. Cow starts milking just fine. After two and a half, three minutes, while she is still milking full flow, the machine kicks out. What is not working? Before I give you the answer, I want you, if possible, some of you can do it, some of you can't. If possible, I always want you to think in terms of pressure in the gray holes. If you can get into that thinking mode, it'll help you tremendously to locate the trouble on this machine very, very quickly. It's going to happen very seldom anyway. You remember, exhaust timer, no pressure building for two minutes. Exhaust, the, the startup timer times out. We are now trying to build pressure, but the whisker valve is exhausting the air that normally pressurize the 10 second chamber. Okay, keep that in mind. We put the machine in the cow, the cow starts milking full bore after about two and a half minutes or whatever, two and a quarter minutes, three minutes, the machine, does, the machine comes out under full milk flow. What happened? Well, for the first two minutes we know what happened. All the gray air ex escaped at the startup timer. The startup timer timed out. We are now building pressure, except for some reason or another, the whisker valve is not moving. The whisker valve is not releasing the air, and therefore, the pressure is building in a 10 second chamber, and the machine comes off too early. Now, why would the whisker valve not be moving and exhausting the air? Well, it's because the pendulum is not moving. And why is the pendulum not moving? It's because the air is not, the milk is not coming in in slugs. It's coming in, it's sort of sneaking by the pendulum, and it's not moving it. Now, why would the milk be sneaking by the pendulum? It has to do with the air bleed on the claw. All claws have air bleeds, and those air bleeds have no other function than to move the milk out of the claw, down the milk hose, and eventually into the pipeline. If that air bleed is plugged in the summer with a fly, uh, cow kicked it, rubbed a little bit of manure in there, what do I know? 
if that air bleed is plugged, the milk will not move in slugs. And this flow sensor depends on slugs. So, that is the one and only reason why the machine would come off early. In other words, cow is milking full bore, the machine won't stay on, won't continue to milk, it comes off early. 999 times out of a thousand, the air bleed hole is plugged up. And that's the only thing I'm going to tell you about it. If that doesn't fix it, call me. We fixed all the leaks, but the machine still is not coming off. Why is it not coming off? Because we're not building pressure in the gray circuit. Why are we not building pressure in the gray circuit? We're getting air in, we fixed all the leaks. How about the whisker valve is worn out? By the way, let's say you bought 20 machines, you're in a double 10 parlor, you can expect to lose maybe one whisker valve a year. They're not very expensive, you're looking at maybe 25, 30 dollars or so. You can expect to lose one of those a year. Uh, why they fail, it's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, we find whisker valves that are five, seven, and 10 years old and working fine, and then others sometimes they fail within a year or so, but it's a low cost component. Anyway, it could be that the whisker valve was worn out. Now, one thing I've got to mention, I have the advantage over you because I'm standing above the sensor. Typically, I would be standing in the pit, be way down here, and it's a little bit more difficult to get in the sensor. So don't try to replay a whisk, replace a whisker valve while it's installed just like this. I would recommend you take a 7 16 wrench, loosen these two bolts up, take the flow sensor out, disconnect the gray air, the gray hose, okay, then take the whisker valve out and test it. The only way to test it is you reconnect it to the gray hose, okay, have a little styrofoam cup, whatever, with water, <coughs> put the switch on, on, on automatic, and put it in the water and obviously if it's leaking because it's worn out you're going to see some bubbles. If you do see the bubbles, it's not a darn thing. Sorry about that. If you do see the bubbles, not a darn thing you can do about it. You may as well take the whisker valve out, throw it away, put a new one in. Okay? However, now comes a trick. And really to be fair, I ought to take the sensor apart from, for you because I need to show you something. By the way, you might as well take the stainless T off, you know, matter of fact, disconnect the sensor right out of the circuit. It just makes it easier to work on, okay? So there's our flow sensor. Easy to work on if you have it in your hand. Quarter inch nut driver if you have one. If not, the old knuckle buster works just fine. You'll work on these machines very, very seldom, by the way. And this is what I'm doing right now. Normally you wouldn't do. I just want to show you the inside. There's a stainless steel shaft and the plastic ring that's pressed on it. We simulate milk flow. That is sort of the movement during the normal milking procedure. Okay. Might as well show you the whisker valve one more time. It's nothing but a little brass body right there. And you can barely see it in the picture. There's a little stainless spring with a little wire, and that's why it's called a whisker valve, because it has a little whisker there. The little stainless whisker goes into the hole on top of the plastic ring there. So now they're engaged, and if the pendulum moves, it keeps that whisker valve open, 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 open. So, the machine is on the cow, cow stopped milking, no more milk flow, but the machine will not come off. We check the MA valve, it's in automatic. We checked the restrictor. It's letting air through just fine. We found some leaks in the gray circuit. We fixed all those. We found that the whisker valve was leaking. We put a new one in. We fixed everything we possibly could think of so far, but guess what? The machine still is not coming off. There's two other reasons. One of them could be, you remember this pilot here? Oh, okay. You remember the pilot? If that pilot becomes very old, many, 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 many years, 
it could start corroding on the inside, it could be worn out, so it could be that the pilot simply got old and weak. The pilot is easy to replace. If you suspect that's where the trouble is, <clears throat> you may as well take it off. Take the right wrench, take a channel lock, take a knuckle buster, loosen it up a little bit, it comes right off. Okay, there it is. Put another one on and you're back in business. There's really nothing you can fix on the inside. I'm not going to explain to you how it works. It's not that expensive. Screw the new one on. Reconnect the gray hose to the back of the pilot. Okay, that gets us to the last component that might be giving you trouble. And that is the amplifier, our quick exhaust valve. And I need to take it apart from you briefly so you know what's on the inside. You get the right wrench here. Okay, we loosen one little bolt and the entire air chamber is in your hands. Pull the gray hose, okay, and now there are three screws. And those three screws have to come out. You open it up and on the inside there is nothing but a little rubber disc right there. That's all. It is a primitive piece of equipment. It's just a little rubber disc and what happens is that without explaining it exactly how it works, when the air goes into the chamber it sneaks by the disc when the air comes out, it also sneaks by the disc, but in the other direction. Let's leave it just at that. What happens is, you remember earlier we talked about that we might have gotten a tiny bit of dust into the air system during transport or installation or assembly, what do we know? If there's a little bit of dirt in the system, it will get caught more often than not on this little rubber disc and then it leaks, okay? The air leaks and we won't build the pressure. What do we do about it? We open it up, we look at the disc, hopefully we can see the dirt, sometimes you can. You simply rub it off with your fingers, just like that, and put it back in. It doesn't matter. This way, that way, take it out, rub it off, put it back in, put the cover back on, orientation doesn't matter. Insert the three screws. Okay, got it back together. The screw is still in the frame here. Push it forward a little bit. Insert the air chamber below it. Tighten the screw up. Oops, wrong wrench. Reconnect the gray hose, and we are back in business. And that's about all we know about air circuitry. That's all you need to know. In summary, you attach the machine to the cow. Cow started milking. Two and a half minutes, three minutes later, while the cow is still milking, the machine comes off. What's the reason? Most of the time, the air bleed hole is plugged on the claw, or the sensor bell moved up on the shaft, or the ring fell, out, fell off the shaft on the other end. They are the three reasons why the machine comes off too early. The other problem, the cow milked out just fine. No more milk flow, but the machine will not come off. Why is it not coming off? Because we're not building pressure in the gray circuit. Why are we not building pressure in the gray circuit? Because maybe the manual automatic switch is in manual. Maybe the restrictor is plugged up. Maybe you have a leak somewhere in the gray circuit. Maybe the whisker valve is old. Maybe the pilot is worn out or maybe there's a little bit dirt in the amplifier. Now, let me summarize it one more time. In order of likelihood, in other words, if you have either one problem or the other, when the machine comes off too early, I think I mentioned that 999 out of 1,000 times the air bleed hole is plugged. Everything else for all practical purposes never happens. When the machine comes out too late, nine out of 10 times, the amplifier is leaking. That's where the problem is. Okay, very easy to fix. We just saw it. 
The second most often problem is you indeed have a leak somewhere in the gray circuit. In other words, a fitting is loose or a hose got busted a little bit and you've got to replace it. Second most common cause or the whisker valve is worn out and that's the third most common cause. Everything else is exotic and for all practical purposes never happens. And that's about all there is to it, keeping the Germania machine going. Once again, whatever trouble there may be usually shows up on new machines. Once they have been working for a couple of months, you'll never touch them again until many, 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 many years later. I don't know whether you noticed, but here's the tools I use to service the machines. A couple of wrenches, a channel, channel lock, happens to be a quarter inch and a screwdriver. You know, we adjusted the speed, we worked in the air circuitry, we replaced the sensor and the whisker valve all with tools you have already. All right. There's a few other things you may want to know about. 10 second timing. Is that the best timing for you? Only you can tell. If you like 5 seconds timing, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, give us a call. While the machine is under warranty for the first 15 months, we'll replace these free of charge. We'll send you 20 new timers of your choose, of your, of your timing choice, and uh, you would replace them yourself. It's easy. You put the uh, timers you have right now in the same box that we ship, ship, you ship it back to us. There you are. By the way, here are the timing chambers. That's a five seconds. There's a five second chamber. 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. So, what else could go wrong? One thing that happens is these claw snaps could wear out after some time either get a stainless one from us or buy a non-stainless one at the hardware store. Sometimes even the hardware store nowadays have stainless ones. One final question that comes up, should we lubricate the square tube? Well, that's one of those questions that's really a personal preference. My recommendation is not to lubricate it. Usually, if we just keep the square tubes real nice and clean, you know, if you ever feel it's not moving right, just wash it off with detergent water and you'll probably be in good shape. And that's the story. That's how you keep a Germania machine going. By the way, I hope you enjoyed watching this tape as much as I enjoyed making it. I hope I covered every point. If I didn't, if you ever run into something that I did not cover, by all means call. Don't hesitate. My cell phone number is right there. I have it with me at all times. Don't worry, I don't answer 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But we genuinely, I genuinely love to hear from you. If it's relative to the machines, if it's relative to something happening or not happening in your parlor, if you have a question on additional equipment, uh, options to the machines, enlarging your parlor, cow traffic question, please call. You're one of my customers. I appreciate your business no end. And we're looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much.